On behalf of the Armenian National Committee of America Western Region, I want to thank you for tuning in to hear the thoughts of our esteemed panelists, prominent Armenian Americans, David Ignatius and Eric Bogosian, who will share their personal views about the significance of President Joe Biden's recent recognition of the Armenian genocide. The ANCA, serving as the largest and most effective grassroots advocacy organization promoting the rights and interests of the Armenian American community, has been at the forefront for over 50 years in securing justice for the Armenian people. In fact, nearly all Armenian Americans are direct descendants of survivors of the Armenian genocide, as generations have persistently and passionately fought for recognition and accountability. After decades of US complicity in Turkey's denial campaign, President Biden was the first modern US president to formally and unequivocally recognize the Armenian genocide just last week. And for that, we are deeply grateful for his courage and humanity. Coming on the heels of near unanimous congressional recognition of the Armenian genocide in late 2019, President Biden's proclamation now makes US recognition complete. As a leading force in the world, the U.S. government's policy on this issue will go a long way in urging Turkey to come to terms with its past and to accept responsibility for the crimes against humanity which have remained unpunished for over a century. But recognition is only one step in our long road to justice. Today, Turkey and its ally Azerbaijan continue their genocidal intent toward the Armenian people with the rhetoric of their leaders threatening to finish what their grandfathers started seizing ancient Armenian lands and destroying all traces of Armenian heritage from the region. The ANCA will continue to mobilize its grassroots strength to build upon US recognition by educating the public, securing congressional action to sanction the perpetrators, putting an end to US military assistance to Azerbaijan, which even now is being used against the Armenian homeland and seeking US direct involvement in the peace process in line with American values favoring human rights, self-determination and accountability. We urge you to visit our social media pages and websites to learn how you can join our March to Justice. Thank you again to David Ignatius, Eric Bogosian, Suzy Abdu and Hagar Shamali for participating in the first of a series of ANCA Western Region Fireside Chats as we bring you different perspectives and an exchange of ideas on how to move forward from here. We look forward to an insightful and robust discussion and thank you again for watching. Thank you, Nora. Welcome everyone to tonight's discussion. My name is Susie Abdu and I have been working closely with uh, Hagar Shamali. Hagar, if you'd like to come on screen. Hi, Hagar. Hi, Susie. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited for this event. Fantastic. We want to, we have been working with the Armenian National Committee of America for uh, a couple of months now. It's been a wonderful experience working with Nora and her team. Uh, and we're excited to bring you to bring you tonight's event with uh, David Ignatius of the Washington Post. Let's tell you a little bit about David. He is a Pulitzer Prize winning author and journalist. He writes a twice a week foreign affairs column for the Washington Post. He has written 11 spy novels, uh, The Paladin, The Quantum Spy, The Director, Blood Money, The Increment, Body of Lies, The Sun King, A Firing Offense, The Bank of Fear, Ciro, or Syro, I may have that wrong, and Agents of Innocence. Body of Lies was made into a 2008 film starring Leonardo DiCaprio and Russell Crowe. Please uh, welcome, let's welcome David Ignatius. Thank you for joining us, David. He's joining us from Washington, DC. Thanks, thanks for having me. Of course. And uh, to have it, uh, tonight, I'm sorry, we have David in conversation with um, Eric Bogosian actor, author, uh, playwright, activist. His last book is on a very unique angle of the Armenian uh, genocide. Uh, he is very vocal about this uh, issue and is joining us tonight with David Ignatius. Thank you, Susie. Thank you for the interesting introduction. <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> I'm honored to be here with David tonight. And I'm also uh, I just want to say thank you to ANCA for their incredibly hard work over the years 
for uh, not only the recognition of uh, the Armenian genocide, but all the hard work uh, to basically give Armenians all over the world dignity for who we are as a people. And they, I, I have always, I got to know uh, Nora and everybody back when my book Operation Nemesis was coming out a few years back. And um, I, I, it's just, uh, I can't thank them enough for all the hard work they've done and you, you're doing tonight. Thank you. Let me join in, in that uh, thank you uh, from uh, Eric. Uh, it's wonderful to be here with Eric. He's a, a great actor and, and playwright. Um, uh, and I'm uh, like Eric, so thankful to, to Nora and Suzy and, and Hagar and Anka. It's great to have this chance. Um, for a fireside conversation about issues we all care deeply about, but we don't have a fire, um, but we'll try to provide some sparks. Uh, I should just say in the matter of family business, uh, Armenians always feel a kinship, but Eric and I have a particular uh, kinship. Eric, Eric's mother's maiden name was Jem Gochen. And my uh, grandmother, Elisa's maiden name was Jam Gochen, and we share common roots in the town of Harper, Harper, uh, as it's sometimes pronounced. So you know we're 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 cousins. We're 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 uh, uh, in in not just in the blood in 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 the in the city. So uh, Eric, um, let me begin by asking the question that I, I think everybody watching um, uh, has. You know, so deeply in in their hearts, and that's what happened on April twenty four when uh, Joe Biden uh, formally recognized the Ar Armenian genocide. I want to ask you where you were when you heard that news, what it meant to you, not, not as a kind of artifact of history, but emotionally as a as a person uh, when you heard it. Um. Well, I had been getting the news, as probably you did as well, for uh, weeks prior, and I wasn't sure if it was going to be, it was going to happen or not. I wasn't sure if people were trying to box President Biden in so that he would have no choice but to recognize it. And I knew that that wouldn't work. Um, if he made the choice to say the word, then it would be because he wanted to say it, not because people just kept moving these rumors around. But the rumors were getting more and more intense right up to the last minute. So in fact, the feeling I had was of relief. Um, I, am, um, I have an interesting connection to April 24th because that's my birthday. And so I have a, a sort of this cosmic connection to this Memorial Day. It's a, it's, I've, I've studied it intensely. I've actually walked the path of the men uh, uh, who got arrested in Istanbul, uh, in Constantinople at the time, and I know its import. I think one of the things that, I mean, in terms of, uh, I mean, I've done a lot of thinking on this topic, and uh, it's it, it, what happened on that day, yes, relief, but at the same time, uh, a sense of a reality that I am very aware of, and that is that Turkey is probably not going to acknowledge the genocide for a while. Now, one of the interesting things about this uh, statement by Biden on the 24th is that the timing of it was particular to this year and that Erdogan does not have a lot of room to move. Um, without going on and on about all the different nuances I know about this topic, but the, the Russia historically wants to control Istanbul. The Bosphorus is very important to them. And they even have a name for Istanbul. They call it Zaragrad. And so he doesn't really want to run into the arms of Putin. Uh, this was something that, as you know, David, going way back, Egypt used to play Russia or the Soviet Union against the United States. And Turkey has played the United States against Russia. If you don't give us money, if you don't give us what we want, we're going to go over to them. Well, he can't do that now. He just can't. The lira is dropping like a stone and he is kind of stuck. Who knows what those men said to each other on the phone the day before, but whatever it was, here we are. But still, Turkey is probably not going to acknowledge it. Why? Because genocide is a legal term and that's something that people have to understand. It has, it's law. 
And so when the word genocide is used, it means that a crime was committed, not kind of a crime or massacres or something really bad, or there was war or all this junk that Turkey likes to say about it, but that there was an actual crime. When Turkey admits the, to the crime, they are going to be stuck with legal battles. You know, even though it was over a hundred years ago, uh, the, the, the major part of the genocide, 1915, 1916, but particularly 1916, huge amount of theft of Armenian properties in all over what we call Turkey today. And, you know, people know where that property is and people can go back and say, I want my land back or I want my mines back. There's a lot of documentation for this. And certainly uh, Germany has given back people who, who uh, inherited artworks, for instance, from people who had stolen from the Jews during World War II have gotten their art back. So this can, this is, this is looming and it's not small. It's a huge amount of property in Turkey and they don't want to give it back. That's just one part of this, but that, those are some of the thoughts that went through my mind on that day. Still, it's very, it, it is very significant for us to memorialize with these words, the people who died, who were sacrificed during that time. Anonymous death is the most horrible death. I live eight blocks north of ground zero and people died and they never found their bodies, thousands of people. This is true also for the bones out of, uh, in the deserts of Derzor or along all over Anatolia that we must remember our, our ancestors. It's all we've got and they keep blocking it. They keep blocking it. They say there, there weren't even any Armenians here in the, I mean, I'm sorry, I, I can really get going here, but the thing is I went, I've been to Turkey a couple of times and you go into a place and you start talking to the shop owner or whatever. Oh, you're a, you're a visiting Turkey. How nice. I'm so glad you could come. How do you like the food? Everything's good. Oh yeah, everything's great. Oh, oh um, this is your first time in Turkey. Yeah, yeah. My, my grandmother comes from Turkey. Oh, really, really? Yeah, I'm Armenian. Oh yes, Armenians, Armenians. Used to be many Armenians here. They went away. That's what they say. But they just went away. This is the this is the world we live. This is Turkey. They just magically went away. So I, uh, because I'm a, a journalist um, like you, I, I spent um, days trying to anticipate this, um, talking to sources. Uh, is it going to happen? Uh, uh, and I wanted to write something before it happened and so wrote, wrote a column on, on the, the day before right. on, on April 23rd um, and, I, and I opened that uh, column by quoting um, a dear departed member of our Armenian family, Vartan Gregorian, who I was lucky enough to, to get to know uh, over the last uh, decade. Um, and I quoted something that, that Vartan said, which I'm gonna, I'm just gonna uh, sh share with all of you. He was asked three years ago in an interview that you can find uh, uh, on, on the web about the genocide. And he responded by saying, we intend to remain. We're, we're, we're here, in other words, but what for? And that's the point. What's our duty as Armenians to prevent others from facing the same thing that we face. And in my conversations with, with Vartan, there was always that emphasis on looking forward, not just looking back, that we grieve for our ancestors. As you said, Eric, those bones are in our, in our, our memories, but in, in our mind's eye, they're, they're, they always remain. But I think Vartan had a powerful point that if we're only people who look backward, and think about this tragedy, and that's the world's identification of us. That uh, that that's not a, as full a life as as Armenians should should want and and have. So I'm curious about that. About even as we look back and cherish these memories, how do you think we can look forward, be involved in the future, uh, have a, an identity, uh, even in dealing with Turkey? 
that's more rich and complicated than this this one awful fact. Well, um, yes, a, a, a moment to think about Barton. What an amazing man he was. Um, it, well, I completely agree, and I and I've said this many times that the the genocide of the Armenians and the um, and the slaughter that happened under Abdul Hamid earlier in the in the late nineteenth uh, century. This is only one chapter of the Armenian history. Armenian history is very, very long. Uh, I'm currently reading about just their relationship to the Crusades, and that's a, that's a thousand years earlier. And in fact, though, uh, you go back even further and there aren't even any Turks in that part of the world. I mean, the Armenians have been there. You go to the world's oldest maps. Well, you will see Armenia, you will see Ararat in the world's oldest maps. Uh, so one thing I like to think about is that all of us, particularly diaspora and Armenians, have to think about who we are as a people beyond the genocide. I mean, if all we ever think about is the genocide, then we're going to be defined by the genocide. And I don't want to be defined by the genocide. In fact, that's one of the th reasons why I believe that what Operation Nemesis did, the topic of my book, uh, was important was because they are basically saying, we exist, you know, we're not sheep, because a lot of the murdering that happened was literally slaughter, taking people in the streets and cutting their throats. So we, we're, that's not who we are. We are this magnificent tapestry of history that goes back to the earliest days of history. And that's what we have to, when we think of ourselves, we think that way. Uh, and, and I agree, we should be thinking forward. Certainly, uh, 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 unfortunately, there's been some really bad stuff going on in Armenian, in the Republic of Armenia over the last, uh, 12 months, but prior to that, there was a tremendous feeling of hope and there was a feeling, and I think it's gonna, it will return that the young Armenians uh, who, particularly around Yerevan, who are involved in like tech and, and all these exciting new professional possibilities are thinking forward and are thinking about who we are. I mean, we are, <laughs> I grew up with a very chauvinistic grandfather who survived the genocide and he basically, taught me as a little kid that uh, Armenians are better than everybody else. I, that's not my political way of thinking of things. I think all people are created equal, but I am pretty proud of being an Armenian. And I do believe that Armenians can be incredibly excellent at what they do, uh, hardworking and very smart. And that that's always our, um, that's our money in the bank. And that's what's going to propel us forward. Regarding relationships with Turkey, however, is a, a topic that um, I am I can get angry about because Turkey is I think it's something like the 11th largest economy in the world. Armenia itself is a very poor country, and there's Armenia, and then there's the diaspora. Who we are many diasporans are actually wealthy, so you have this weird balance of power between. But Turkey, in its relation to the Republic of Armenia, which is in many ways, not really my business, but as an Armenian diaspora, and to some degree it is, uh, they, they have closed the border. They do not open their borders. They, they subsidize Azerbaijani attacks on Armenia. They uh, also go further. The genocide is still going on, by the way. They uh, have institutionalized erasure of the Armenian people, not just in their lobbying in Washington, the millions and millions of dollars that they spend in Washington and also you know, uh, subsidizing chairs at places like Princeton, but they also, um, they have museums all over the country. There are 50 history museums all over Turkey that all the school kids go to. If you go to one of those museums, and I've been to them, there is no mention of Armenians. And let's be honest, the Turks came into the Armenian world. The Armenians did not come into the Turkish world. They were there in the first place. And so when you look at the history, uh, for instance, if you go to Hagia Sophia in Istanbul, right next door is something called the Anatolian History Museum. No mention of Armenians whatsoever going back to ancient history. They are attempting to erase us, erase the Armenian people. And likewise in school textbooks and so forth. So for example, when my son, Travis went to Brown, he met Turkish kids there who were also going to college, and they were very angry at him that he would talk about these topics because they didn't believe that any of it was true because that's what they grow up learning. 
eventually Turkey has to has to deal with this because if they're going to have a civil society, if they're going to interact with other countries, if they're going to have trade, they have to have courts. If they're going to have courts, they have to have universities. You can't go to a university and learn an alternate history and then and then find out that it was all baloney, which it is. And 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 this story comes up all the time. I mean, I know uh, um, many Turkish uh, scholars who you know had this wake up call as they got into graduate school, oh, all these things we always learned, none of it's true. Um, so uh, there is the, the, the onus is on Turkey to make the move. Uh, if nothing else, you know, they stole all this property. I mentioned that before. Legally, they have already said that they, were, they would return properties to Armenians. They have not returned any properties to Armenians. In fact, you can go to, if you go to Istanbul, there are Armenian churches there closed, can't go in them, you know. There, there's some you can go in and there's some that are just any properties turkey doesn't if it belongs to armenians the church closed no trespassing it's it, they it's on them to make a move a real move not a one of these fake we're gonna have discussions and panels and so forth didn't you I, have some kind of you had some kind of interaction with Erdogan at some point, didn't you? I, did, did I ever? Uh, <laughs> famously at Davos in two thousand nine, um, I was moderating a conversation with him and Shimon Peres and Ban Ki Moon, the uh, UN Secretary General and the head of the Arab League, and uh, they had all taken turns beating up on. Shimon Peres, uh, and uh, we came at the end of the discussion. <laughs> I, I said, uh, you know, uh, well, that's 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 all the time that we have. And Erdogan had been furiously making notes, getting ready to uh, deliver further comments. And I, I said, um, you know, I'm, I'm sorry, Mr. Prime Minister, as he, as he then was, but that's that's all the time we have. And um, he got so angry that he walked off the stage and it was a very dramatic uh, moment. I should just say uh, the path I chose as my career is as a journalist. And so I, I've traveled often to Turkey. I interview Turkish diplomats and other officials. Um, and as long as I'm a, a journalist, I don't want anyone, whether they're from Turkey, Azerbaijan, or anyone else to say, you can't cover us, uh, you're Armenian. And so uh, that necessarily, you know, I, the, the passion that you're bringing this conversation, um, I, sh I share, but I also need to remember that um, uh, in this job that I've chosen, uh, uh, I, I, I need to preserve whatever that journalistic uh, uh, quality is. Um, I want to share with with you, Eric, and with everybody who's watching, what uh, our our beloved uh, Bartan Gregorian's answer to this question of how we how we embrace the past but also uh, the, the the present and the future. What what his answer was? He co-founded um, with Nubara Fayan, who we know is a great entrepreneur. The person who created Moderna, whose vaccine I've taken, my family has taken, my 100-year-old father, who I hope is watching, uh, has, has taken, and, and a man named Ruben Vardanyan, a Russian-Armenian. Together, they founded something called the Aurora Humanitarian Initiative. And every year since 2016, they have given a prize. It's really one of the leading human rights prizes in the world to somebody who in our time is helping the victims of genocide as the people who helped our ancestors, the ones who survived uh, in that terrible time in, in 1915. Uh, and their motto is gratitude in action. Our, our gratitude as Armenians, survivors, part of a, a people who continue and have this force of life and continuity despite tragedy. The, we want to honor honor the people who were heroes in our time. So we, this prize has, has gone to a, a, a Burundian woman uh, who helped save uh, victims of the genocide in Rwanda. It's gone to um, 
goodness, a, a, a Yazidi activist when the Yazidis were being butchered by ISIS. Uh, it's it's gone to a doctor who almost alone in the Nuba Mountains of Sudan, where there was a kind of modern genocide, has been caring for people. Uh, most recently, it, it went to two um, Somali uh, women who are, are trying to, to help save uh, women's rights and lives. So uh, I like this idea that as Armenians, we embody not simply this terrible atrocity that was done to us, but the, the, the intensity, generosity, um, embrace of the world that helps us to, to reach out uh, and to exhibit this quality. Again, I'll, I'll say the phrase that Vartan put in my mind, gratitude in action. So that, that uh, I just want to share that with, with everybody because the Aurora Prize will be uh, given again this fall, uh, either in Yerevan, where I've been the master of ceremonies for, for five of these um, events, or maybe even in America. I think that'd be great. Um, but, but that's, Eric, that's, that's one part of the complicated answer to the question that we've been talking about. Well, I, 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 agree, I, I agree with that. Sentiment. Um, I'm not just Armenian. I'm American, and as an American, I am responsible for the actions of my government. Or when I support anything uh, that involves these horrible situations, I mean, whether they're legally genocide or not, I'm a pacifist. Very deep in the wool pacifist and I don't believe in good war. I just don't believe in it. I don't think there is such a thing. Every war involves women and children being murdered and hurt and rape and innocent people being wrapped up in it. And so anything I can do to kind of, this is, I mean, what this all comes down to from my perspective and the, in the greater picture is that um, there's, the answers are kind of boring it's a State Department kind of thing, trying to bring in as much diplomacy as possible to bring people together. I agree with you on that, because everything you can possibly do to slow down the violence between people is worth it. And I don't care whether they have to sit at tables for weeks on end negotiating. It may sound, it may sound dull and it may seem like it's not getting anywhere, but it's still better than tanks rolling, machine guns, and the horrible stuff that I saw in Artsakh, I could barely watch the videos that I was watching, those drone strikes. Um, but, you know, we're also using drones in places. And as a pacifist, I, I am against all of this sort of thing. I want to see a reduction in violence all over the world. I also don't always believe that the thing that we're being told is what the, 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 the fighting is about is that it's necessarily about that. You know, it's it, you know, it's it's one religion against another religion. I don't know if that's always the case. Very often, there are people running everything who, for whatever selfish reasons, they want to have these wars and fights and and so forth. Um, I'd like to throw in a thought that is a new thought that came to my mind just in the last twenty four hours when I saw. I didn't read the article, but there was something about Iran and Saudi Arabia. Um, kind of back channeling, making peace between each other. And this also applies to what's happening with Turkey because all of these countries have power vis-a-vis -vis the United States because of their strategic relationship to petroleum. And 20 years from now, that petroleum is just gonna be a bunch of black gunk in the ground and it's not gonna be <laughs> worth anything to them. And when it's not worth anything, then we're not gonna be not, we're not gonna care about it. We're not gonna be over there. We're not gonna give them the guns, nothing. And they better figure out what they're gonna do in the future when we don't care about whether we have an air base in Eastern Turkey or if we have an air base in Iraq or an air base in Saudi Arabia or wherever it is. So I, I'd like to believe, I like to think positively that we may be moving toward a world where the Middle East isn't a place where everybody just can't wait to kill each other, you know. And Armenia is 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 part of that. Obviously, the our strategic. This is this is the part. I mean, I think it's very important for all Armenians or anybody interested in this to just take out a map and look at where the Republic of Armenia sits. And that's why Turkey has this strategic relationship to the United States. You know all this, but I mean, um, Iran um, is right on the border. 
I mean, people in people in Tehran take these 38 hour uh, bus rides to Yerevan so they can go dancing and listen to pop music because they're not allowed to do that there. And so when you go to, you know, because you've been to Yerevan, you go to Yerevan, there's all these slick people walking around in expensive clothing. They're, they're the Iranians who, are, who showed up to party because uh, they can't party in Iran. Uh, and then there's Russia right there too. So, um, you know, one of the strange things in history was that for a brief moment there uh, in 1918, I guess it was, um, Armenia, the Republic of Armenia, the new little Republic of Armenia, Georgia and Azerbaijan were allies. They were the Transcaucasian Federation. And that was the last thing Russia wanted was a Transcaucasian Federation on their border. And so Stalin did everything he could to foment um, the, this anger between these countries. And he was very successful because it keeps going on forever. And now it's the dictator of Azerbaijan. It's in his interest to keep all this this pot boiling, because that's how these guys stay in power, and Erdogan as well. It's it's terrible. It's terrible, and I just I just feel for the people, the the poor people on the ground, the peasants, and then peasants or whatever, just people living in these small towns, villages, who have to suffer because of all this uh, warfare. They don't. There, worry. Yeah, just, there is a the there's a future in which in which Armenia. Uh, is the crossroads, in fact, that, that it is um, in, in spirit um, and that amazing ability Armenians have had through time to work with other people uh, ha has a, uh, a practical expression. Uh, and, and there's a time when, as you said, Eric, the, the most valuable commodity won't be oil, or gas, it'll be brain power. And hopefully, if Armenians keep, you know, emphasizing good values and, and education, and, and we in the diaspora support that in whatever ways we can, that uh, that's going to be part of the of the future. So in the in the time that we have left, I want to ask you, Eric, to talk a little bit about your book. Operation Nemesis. Uh, if uh, folks don't don't know this, Eric had, did a detailed, probably the, you know the most detailed history I know of the assassination of Talat Pasha, the Minister of the Interior of the uh, Ottoman Empire, and the young Armenian uh, Telerian, I think his name was, who 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 killed him as part of a, a movement, Operation Nemesis, that killed uh, Eric um, seven uh, people who'd been part of this, this death machine. And I want to ask you to talk about, about, about the book in the context of the broader theme of vengeance for the injustices of the past. The, the New York Times said when they reviewed uh, your, your book that, uh, to your great credit, you had not treated Tellurion, this uh, young Armenian, a, as a hero, that, that you'd had a, a really nuanced uh, uh, assessment of what this means. And maybe you could share that with, with viewers tonight as we think about the, the genocide and, and the response to it. Well, first of all, that, that's... Um, the New York Times opinion of whether I treated Tetlerian as a hero or not, because I do think of him as a hero, but a very special hero. And you have to read the book to get into all the complexities of it, a very complex and ultimately um, a man who suffered greatly due to the fact that he discovered that his whole town had been murdered, 25,000 people. And then he wanted to avenge them and then got picked up by this group that was being run by Armin Garo out of um, Massachusetts. And this death squad was sent into Europe, not just uh, Tetlerion, but a number of um, men with military experience or, or experience with guns. And they went and they tracked down the perpetrators of the genocide all over uh, in, in Constantinople, in Tbilisi, in Rome, in Berlin. And they found these guys and they gunned them down in the street. They felt that it was essential that they, that they do this. This is an existential act. I mean, it is outside of law. It's outside of the law of man. It's outside the law of God. 
But somehow it's, I felt that it was justified because it just simply had to happen. Um, the crime that had been committed against the Armenian people had been so great that these men literally could not live unless they acted. Um, now, since then, there have been other times when there has been violence uh, as retribution against Turks. And I have different feelings about that. And you'd have to look at the book to, to get all the, the nuances of that. But um, the, the thing about Operation Nemesis is it was extraordinary because these guys who ran this operation, people say, oh, it was like um, Munich, that movie Munich that Spielberg made about what happened in Munich. It's not, these aren't, these aren't secret agents. These aren't trained agents. These are businessmen living in New England and upstate New York who felt that they just had to do something. And they organized this. They found the guys who could, who could do the killings and, and deftly moved into Europe and then, and then just disappeared. In 1922, disbanded and the whole thing just disappeared. And for many, many years, people did not know this whole story. I certainly didn't. I had eventually heard about Tetlerion, but there was a whole cover story for Tetlerion that had survived all these decades, that he was a student, he happened to have just see Tal up in the street and he gunned him down. I mean, Samantha Power repeats the story, Peter Balakin repeats the story in their books. But um, then I became, a, I was gonna write a movie about it, thinking this, would, this is an easy movie to write. This is a very emotional and there's a courtroom trial and all of this. And then the minute I started, um, uh, doing research, I came across Jacques de Rogier's book, which had been published in the 80s, small French book, very hard to read, that explains Operation Nemesis. So now I think, oh, I'll, um, there's no book like this in the United States, so I'm going to make a kind of an easy to read version of this book. And then I, and I fell down the rabbit hole and for seven years, I uh, had to write about, I had to learn Armenian history, I had to learn everything about Armenian history and Turkish history and sultans and everything in order to really get the big picture that's all in my book too but um yeah the this is an extraordinary moment in history what these men did and women and um and i, I every armenian should be aware of it because it was uh it, it was a payback but it was much more than that it was that we exist as a people and we remember those who died, and this is how we show that. And we cannot let this stand. And they found Talat, and they got him, and they got uh, Dr. Shakir, and they got they got most of them. They didn't get Enver. Uh, Enver was got by the Russians, and then there was one last guy, Doc. Well, not one last guy, but there was last big player was Dr. Nazim, and uh, Ataturk hanged him. So. They all, there was no one left. And then there was Ataturk. And then there was a whole new chapter, which is actually still, it's the same old, same old. That's one of the big myths of Turkey and Turkish history is that when Kemal Ataturk took over, like all that other stuff was old, all that genocide, that's all from before. And now it's now, and that's not true at all. I mean, Ataturk continued to persecute Armenians and Greeks and Jews, and this continued intensely through the 1950s and uh, to this day they still they're still destroying documents they're still destroying history they're still trying to cover it up and um, I, I, I think in the same reason that the, the the operation nemesis people had to do what they had to do I have to say what I have to say because you can't let we can't let them get away with it and there isn't a middle ground it's to, to, all, to quote Peter Balakian it's not symmetric. You have a very powerful country and you have a very weak country. And we, we need to appeal to justice in, these, is, in this situation. And um, I'm gonna keep appealing to, to justice uh, because it's, you know, we'll win in the end and we're winning. And thanks to Joe Biden, we just took a big step forward. And thanks to you. So that's, that's probably a pretty good, uh place to to end our our fireside conversation we promised we'd uh, uh, let this go at uh, uh 45 minutes fire was in my hair my hair was on fire that was well was fire. it uh, and, and and powerfully so um it, it's such a pleasure to be able to have a, this conversation with, with eric whose work i deeply respect um i, I know all, all of us do uh, and uh to be able to to talk 
about this event that's so important for us uh, as Armenians, but I, I hope will be important for the whole world. I think you know, truth and justice is everybody's business. Uh, and I think Joe Biden did something uh, not just for Armenians, but, but for the world. So uh, with that, I wanna, I wanna thank Eric for joining me and turn this back to Hagar Shamali who um, has done so much in the, in the weeks and months before Biden's announcement to, to prepare the ground. And uh, Hagar, why don't you take, take us out? Thank you. Sure, thank you so much, David. And thank you, Eric, and both of you for joining this conversation and for agreeing to it at the last minute and, uh, and for doing it on a Sunday. Um, today's conversation has been so wonderful for so many reasons. Um, not only because we're hearing from the two, two of the leading thinkers on these issues and the history related to the Armenian genocide, but also all the issues that you touched upon uh, surrounding it. Um, there have been really truly no conversations I've heard about this topic that ran the gamut the way you guys, uh, the way you covered it. So um, I wanna thank you for that. I know all of our all of our listeners are probably thanking you for that as well. One of the things that struck me, um, Eric, that you mentioned was that you're not just Armenian, but that you're American as well. And as a result, there are values that you uphold and you wanna see general peace and stability and humanity. Um, and I think that's so important. Um, and David, I think that story about Erdogan is just absolutely amazing. Um, I have been really privileged to work with Anka these last few months um, on the efforts to get President Biden to declare the Armenian genocide and to raise attention and awareness uh, to that issue and to the importance of that. And in addition to the obvious reasons for that, um, my great grandfathers on both sides uh, are Armenian, uh, one of whom escaped the massacre of Diyarbakir in the late 1800s in Turkey. Um, and so it's as Nora mentioned, anyone here who has Armenian blood probably descended in some way from the survivors of the genocide. Um, and so this project has been among the most rewarding I have ever worked on, for sure. Uh, and so, uh, and I too believe that President Biden's declaration is, uh, there will be rever reverberations that uh, in foreign policy that we have yet to even understand, not just in terms of uh, Armenian identity and the restoration of that or preservation of that, um, but in US, the US relationship to Turkey, how Turkey behaves, and certainly David, as you just mentioned, how governments or militaries around the world who are aggressive, like those in China or Myanmar uh, or Ethiopia, just to name a few, uh, how they might act now that they know that the United States is not afraid to acknowledge the truth. It's a really, it's an, uh, it's an amazing time to be talking about these issues and to be living them. So thank you again all for, for joining. Thank you, David and Eric, for leading this discussion. And thank you all for listening in on a Sunday night. And good night to all.